Come on. No. Yes. She's all dolled up, folks. Come on. <laughs> now we gonna put up a privacy screen for you. Yes. Come on, woman up. Let's go. Need a driver. There she is. Six days into spring break, and this is what we're down to. Divorce. Divorce. <laughs> Step they were on when they decided to sell this car. Hi, lady. Thanks for your help. Yeah. I'm gonna go watch Elmo. <laughs> <laughs> well, look what the cat dragged in. It's a 2007 Chevrolet something cat. Cat. Hold on. Hold on, folks. I didn't research this before I turned the camera on. Captiva. Captiva. There you go. Just picked this up off a of Facebook marketplace. Bought it from one of those super sketchy junk car buyers. You know the guys. Cameraman here, folks. We're gonna do some rocket horses. We got them in the Jeep Grand Cherokee six cylinder. What's it got, stud man? So I believe this is actually built by Daewoo in Korea, kind of like the Equinox. Don't know very much about them. It's a small kind of crossover SUV. This is not four-wheel drive, this is front-wheel drive only. And it has the 2.4 liter four-cylinder Ecotec engine. Does not run. Guy I bought it from says it had no oil in it. He thinks the engine's locked up because they ran it out of oil. These 2.4 liter Ecotex are kind of notorious oil burners. They also have a lot of problems with timing chains and oil dilution due to the direct injection. So, yeah. Anyway, probably needs an engine. Not sure yet. So, cosmetically, it's not too bad. Got a few dents. But, this is an Oklahoma car. And it has no rust on it at all. Which is... Quite a treat for us here in Northern Illinois. Something we don't see very often. Anyway, shut the doors, throw the battery charger on it, take a little gander under the hood. Now, the interior is kind of rough. People who owned it were smokers and apparently drinkers based on the 12-step the book that we found inside. Anyway, I needed a project, so here we go. Okay, the mighty Ecotech. Most of this intake garbage is already loose. So we'll just go ahead and take it off. Well, oh, there's an engine under there. And for whatever reason, both battery cables are loose. But look at these terminals. They're perfect. There's not a single speck of corrosion anywhere. Don't see batteries like this in Illinois, I'll tell you that much. All right, we'll turn that up to 11 and move on to something else. All right, I pulled the right front wheel off and then I pulled this little, I don't know what it is, little dust shield back so I can get access to the end of the crankshaft. We're gonna try to turn this thing over. He said it's locked up, but I'm not 100% not convinced. 
he already cut the belt so you can see it kind of laying down there I guess he thought it was maybe an alternator locked up or something like that uh, ah, see well it's not locked up but I can't make a full turn on it so let me get that belt out of there Well, it hit something pretty hard there. I wonder if we got a broken timing chain. These engines are also notorious for eating timing chains. So. She's got a tight spot right there. Alright guys, so it's kind of hard to ascertain what happened here. There's no oil visible on the dipstick, so it's definitely been using a lot of oil. But the engine's not locked up. I guess not 100% locked up, but it will not make a complete revolution. And I can hear something kind of metallic catching and grinding in there as I'm turning the crankshaft. So I think we might have a broken timing chain or some kind of problem with the timing chain. I'm gonna take the valve cover off. It doesn't look too bad. Uh, pretty straightforward as far as I can tell. I think I'll just go ahead and pop the valve cover off and then we can have a look at the timing chain. I don't think there's anywhere else you can see it without dropping the pan or the valve cover. Valve cover seems a little bit easier to me. Things clear full of these locks. It's like some kind of freaking Chrysler product. Well, I don't know. Doesn't look too bad. Really. I don't know, I hear compression. What is going on there? I can't tell what I'm hearing. What is that sound? All right, are you guys hearing that? Am I just crazy? I don't know, is it in the bottom end of the engine or the bottom end of the timing cover? I hear something scraping. I mean, this timing chain is, you know, it's not good, but the tensioner, I think, might be oil, oil pressure driven, so we might not have to worry too much about that. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Well, that sounds pretty sick. 
it's definitely got some kind of a skip so we're down we're down a couple cylinders so yeah I guess we could pop the spark plugs out and do a quick compression test well that's not good cylinder number one it's all slobbery with oil the other three looked pretty good so I think we'll start our compression test with cylinder number one close the door please <laughs> Hey, where are you going? Move your stuff. Move all my stuff? I'm, I'm going in. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mom. Go ahead. You're all right. Say hi. Hi. All right, kiddo. Go ahead. All right, the valves should all be closed. Oh, here we go. All right, folks, I don't see any reason to go any further. It's building no pressure in that cylinder. We can't hear anything from the intake. Can't hear anything from the exhaust. It's all going down into the crankcase. So cylinder number one must have failed pretty spectacularly. Yeah, you can saw it up, kiddo. Okay, go ahead and saw Dad's car. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to be looking for an engine. There's no way I'm fixing this one. <laughs> All right, so I was, I was playing around here, trying to figure out what might have happened to cylinder number one. This is the dipstick out of the engine. I stuck it down in the spark plug hole. Uh, as far as I can tell, there is no cylinder number one. It's, it's not there. <laughs> so something very, very terrible must have happened to this, to this engine. Because I'm pretty sure, pretty sure we should have hit something. <laughs> oh boy I don't think we're going to be able to fix it people well I tried sticking the boroscope down inside the cylinder to see what I could see and I don't all, I, all I'm seeing is shrapnel I wonder if there's a rod hanging out the side of this thing because it's definitely whatever's inside there is not moving when I turn the crank so Wonder if it threw a rod. Let's uh, let's investigate that. I don't see a pool of oil underneath of it though. Yeah, something very catastrophic happened to cylinder number one. All right, guys, I made a few phone calls and found a used engine for our Captiva back here. The 2.4 liter Ecotec, you know, certainly had a lot of problems, but that did not stop GM from using that engine in basically everything. So these engines are are not hard to find and they're not that expensive. So there is no reason to go to go bananas trying to do anything with the old engine other than tearing it out of the car and uh, sending it to the crusher. We'll get ourselves a good running used engine and replace it. The used engine is going to come with a 30 day warranty and I asked him specifically if the warranty would cover excessive oil consumption because I know these 2.4 liters are, are known oil burners. He said yes it would so we'll, we'll get to swapping it out. Okay I pushed the car backwards onto the lift and then picked up the tail end just to make it a little bit easier to work under the hood. So I think right now the plan is to pull this engine out through the top. It's a four cylinder engine so they'll almost always come out the top. I'm sure if you look in the service information what it's going to tell you to do is go underneath the car, unbolt the engine frame, cradle, pop the ball joints or the struts or something loose 
and then take the whole engine, transmission, cradle, everything out the bottom. So I don't think it's necessary for the four cylinder. There should be plenty of room for it to come up through the top. It can be a little bit tricky to get to some of the bell housing bolts, but if we tear the battery box and computer and stuff out of here, it shouldn't be too bad. So if this was a V6 engine, I think we wouldn't have a choice. We'd have to go out the bottom. There's probably not even enough room between the, the cowl and the core support here to come out with a V6 engine, but this little four cylinder, I don't, I don't think it'll be a problem. So that's the plan anyway. Off to a bad start, people. Bad start. Okay, we're getting somewhere. We've got the wiring harness mostly loose, so we'll just peel the whole thing off and kind of tuck it over there on the driver's side. Then I pop the O2 sensor out and the heat shield off, and you see the exhaust manifold is cracked right there. Super common, 2.4 liter problem. So we'll see if we can get one of those. I mean. All the used ones are cracked, so we'll see what see what the price is for a, a new one. Otherwise, we might just weld that one up. Like I said, super common problem with these these engines. And then I got to figure out what to do with the power steering pump. I don't think I have to pull the pulley off. I think I can just pull this whole bracket off. And I'm not sure if I'm going to take the intake manifold off or not. I kind of think I will because it's pretty tight between the core support and the cowl. I've got to get those three bolts that go into the catalytic converter loose, which may or may not happen. And then we're going to drop the whole catalytic converter down out of the bottom because there's not room for it to, to be in there. So we may have to take the exhaust manifold off too before we can get the whole thing out. I don't know. We'll just have to see how it goes. So yeah, pretty tight quarters in here. Can't believe they ever put a V6 in these things. Well, whoever designed this accessory bracket sure as hell never had to work on it. What a stupid thing this is. So you can't get the last bolt out of the alternator because it hits this power steering line. So I guess in order to pull the alternator off, you're supposed to pull the power steering pump. I don't know. That sure seems stupid to me. There's got to be another way. I don't know. Also, did anybody spot that little guy right there? She definitely threw a rod. Got a hole right in the side of the block. So there's your problem, lady. I hate this kind of stuff. What a bunch of dicks. All I had to do was make that power steering line go somewhere else. Why would they do that? <laughs> Will it come out of there? Come on, you bastard. Huh. Take that, GM engineers. Stupid power steering pump. Which, I mean, it's not that big a deal to remove the power steering pump. It's just, it's a press fit. You only get so many times pressing those pulleys on and off before you gotta replace them. I'd rather just not do that. This thing sucks to work on though, I can tell you that. I'd do 20 Toyotas for every one of these.
All right, we're down below. I'm gonna pull this catalytic converter off. I managed to get one nut off here at the flange, but I broke the other one, so wasn't much left of it. Pretty standard deal. We'll just drill that out and put a, a bolt all the way through. No worries there. Oh, let's see if we can get this thing off here. Okay. <sighs> Brackets in the way. Well, thanks to the GM parts bin engineering system here. We cannot get a socket on this lower bolt here on this rear axle bearing bracket. But we can get one on the top too, I think. Well, maybe just one of them. Oop, painted myself into a corner here. So you gotta do it the hard way with a wrench. And you can see I'm gonna quickly run out of room for that, so probably just zip that one bolt out so I can get a socket on it. Problem solved. Okay, so that's loose. <laughs> no dowel pins or anything in that. Crazy. Okay. I think that might be it for the back of the engine, other than the bell housing bolts. Okay, the front of the engine's got quite a bit more going on. So the AC compressor is here. I just unbolted that. We're gonna let it sit there on the cradle. No need to discharge the system or anything like that. Just take the compressor off. Behind that is this little gizmo here. I think that's a vacuum pump. It's tied in with the vacuum system anyway. And then behind that would be the starter. You have to pull the starter out in order to access oh where are they so you have to pull the starter in order to access the flex plate bolts right there so I will zip the bolts out of the flex plate and then we should be ready to take the bell housing bolts out and pull this thing up out of here really isn't too bad of a job okay I think that's about as far as I can go for today gotta get my lovely assistant out here tomorrow to help me take the hood off get the gantry crane over here get the engine chained up and we'll zip the bell housing bolts out here on the top and this other engine mount should be able to just right on up out of there the transmission should sit there just fine that's the plan anyway so we've got the lower radiator hose off the whole wiring harness is kind of balled up over here on the driver's side in where the battery used to be got the upper radiator hose off power steering pump on the whole accessory bracket and everything can just kind of hang out there uh, the alternator is out there's your AC compressor that weird little vacuum pump and yeah that's pretty much everything so yeah not too bad of a job just you can tell GM just phoned this engine in completely like the the high pressure fuel pump here was obviously just a, just an add-on when they went to the direct injection and it, when the cover's over top of it, you can't even see the oil filter. And then the whole engine bay is just full of little, you know, brackets and, and patches that you can tell were added later. So, I guess that's the penalty for using the same engine, you know, basically across your entire platform. Too bad it wasn't a better engine. All right, my lovely assistant is here to help. So excited. Want to get your shout outs in now? Plus we've got our trusty dog. Hey kiddo. And someone let in a bear. Bro. Ah!
Thank you, assistant. You're welcome. You can't fit through there, kiddo. Why is Max trying to get inside this car? Because I think there was another dog inside there once and he wants to go check it out. Mm. Leave the car alone, pup. He's very curious about it. He thinks he's on camera. We need to fix the turning radius on your John Deere there, kiddo. She's not very... It takes a half acre to turn it around. It's loose. Okay, Let's see if we can get it out of there. Well, we can guarantee this is not an Illinois car because I just reached down in here and popped the dipstick out. That never happens. And then the dowel pins that go into the bell housing just slid right out. No hammers, no pry bars, no, no nothing. I don't know, this is what it's like to be a mechanic in Oklahoma. I'm moving pretty nice. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pull the exhaust manifold off just to make it easier to get that last little bit out. There we go. A baby is born. Not a bad job, really. So I ended up, there's a bracket right here that holds an idler pulley at the bottom. I ended up taking that off, and that gave me enough room to get the engine out without taking the exhaust manifold off. But I should have just taken the exhaust manifold off. I mean, you can access it pretty good from the bottom, and it doesn't really matter if we break all the studs off. The engine's junk, and the exhaust manifold is junk. So, I mean, what difference does it make? But anyway, not a bad job really, all told. I think I've got about, I don't know, three, maybe three and a half hours in pulling that engine. Really isn't that bad of a job at all. Yeah, pup, I know. We'll go outside and play. Yeah, we'll go. Well, the winter weather just won't give up. We're all getting really restless. You know, Max and I both have about a terminal case of cabin fever. Yeah, we'll go outside and play, pup. Just give me a minute. All right, folks, I think we'll cut it off here as the end of part one. Like I said, I did find a used engine to replace this bucket of bolts. So we'll get it in here and get it set next to this one. Strip off everything that we need to strip off, move it over. I've got to order some gaskets. Uh, there's also a few other parts that are kind of messed up or, or missing. The battery hold down hardware is all missing. The air box cover, a couple of the tabs are broken off. You know, standard full gorilla stuff. So. We'll figure out what we can do with that. There's a couple of other questions I have that we probably won't be able to answer without actually running, running and driving the car. I don't know if the catalytic converter is bad, you know, if it's been burning oil for a long time. Good chance that it's, it's smoked, uh, but we'll, we'll try it and see. It's not a big deal to replace it. Uh, pretty much everything came out without an issue. I didn't break any other bolts. Uh, a lot of the plastic clips did not survive. Uh, GM uses those junk Christmas tree clips, and you know, it's pretty much a one-time use deal. So. 
that's all just for wiring looms and stuff. We'll deal with that when the time comes. So thanks guys for watching, and if you've got a 2.4 liter Ecotec, be sure to check your oil. So just a few words on the other elephant in the room, that is the coronavirus. Uh, the governor of Illinois has just announced that we're going into kind of a uh, sort of a shutdown. He's asked that all, uh, quote, non-essential businesses shut down until April 7th. And I believe all schools and most government facilities are going to be closed until that time as well. I don't know how many cases of coronavirus there are in Illinois. I believe it's somewhere around 500. I don't know how many people have died. Uh, but I live in a pretty rural area and you know I work by myself in my own my own business so life hasn't really changed a whole lot for me other than there's just there's just nothing going on there's no work to be done um, auto repair businesses you know auto parts stores and auto repair shops are considered essential businesses so I, I am free to to keep my business open and th there's no travel restrictions or anything like that other than they're just asking people not to travel for non-essential purposes so if you want to go get food or Go to the doctor's office or visit a, you know, a relative or a loved one. That's totally fine. They just don't want people, you know, being reckless, which I guess I can understand. But uh, yeah, we're we're definitely seeing some economic impact, and I think we're going to be we're going to be paying for this one for a long time. So we're all doing fine here, and I hope everybody out there is staying safe. And uh, yeah, we're just waiting for this to kind of hopefully peak and uh, get on the other side of it. So thanks for watching and I'll have part two coming up pretty soon. All right, it's my turn to be the assistant. 